Hi, I'm Jimmy Connors. This is the first in a two-volume set of videos called Jimmy Connors Tennis. The second volume concentrates on match strategy. But in this tape, I'm going to teach you winning fundamentals, the basics necessary to concentrate on no matter what level of player you are. We're going to cover all the basic skills, footwork, ground strokes, volleys, the serve, the grip, approach shots, and I'll show you my own way of playing tennis. That's winning tennis. As you know, I'm left-handed. I'll translate some of the shots for right-handers, but otherwise you'll find reversing what I say quite easy. Now, what is the ready position? It's a position where you should be very relaxed and very comfortable to the point where you feel you can do just about anything. Uh, move to your left if it's your forehand or your backhand or your right so that you can be prepared to get there in time and be able to stroke the ball comfortably. Uh, the ready position is uh, very simple. You should be standing there a little bit on your toes, uh, semi-bouncing up and down a little bit with a racket out in front of you which makes it a lot easier to go to your left or to your right. Uh, there should be no tension involved in this position, only relax so that you feel comfortable and able to move fluently. Well, footwork is something that uh, along the way becomes very important uh, in the later stages, I would feel. Uh, not that it's not very important at the beginning, but uh, there are a lot of players out there, I'm sure myself included, who uh, is very happy to hit the ball at, at any position, any way he can, just to get the ball over the net. Now, as far as learning from the very beginning, I would feel that it would be more important for the beginner to learn to get his feet in the right place, to get his body in the right place so that he can get everything down perfect at the very beginning. It's important in my footwork to keep moving at all times, to pick my feet up and to lay them down, knowing that at any time I can move in any direction, whatever the shot calls for. It's a bit like basketball in being able to jump to move and to run, knowing that any time I can change directions and still come down ready to play the next shot. It's important to stay on the balls of my feet also. When I'm on the balls of my feet, I feel I'm ready for anything, except playing five-hour matches. <laughs> Starting off with a, a good, solid, basic grip is, is important for your, really for your whole game and where you're going from there. Uh, 
for me, the grip has is, is, um, always been one where I was, just like I was shaking hands, I'd stick out my hand and grab onto the racket and whatever felt comfortable is, is what I stayed with. Uh, there are so many grips. There's uh, the Eastern grip, there's the Western grip, there's the, the shake hands grip that I call it that I use, there's the Continental grip. Uh, but it's always one that, that, uh, that feels comfortable for you. Right now I'm showing you the Eastern grip. Uh, you can tell the Eastern grip by the V that's made by the thumb and the forefinger which runs down the top of the racket handle. Uh, now uh, I'm showing the Eastern grip for the right-handed player. Uh, once again, the V made by the thumb and the forefinger runs right down the top of the racket handle. I'm still into the Eastern grip right now, but to change from the Eastern to the Continental, you, you, for me as a left-hander, you turn your hand a quarter of a turn to the right of my grip, which now means that the V made between my thumb and my forefinger is to the right of my racket handle and da almost down the side. For the right-handed player, I'm going to change from the Eastern grip, which i just shown you, to the Continental. So I'm going to turn my hand a quarter of a turn uh, to the left so that the V made by the thumb and the forefinger is running down the left side of my racket handle. I've shown you the Eastern and the Continental grip. Now I'd like to demonstrate a way to easily find the Western grip. I'll put my racket down on the court, take my hand away and go to just to grab the racket from the top. As I pick it up, I have a western grip which is shown by the way my knuckle is running down the top of my racket handle. Okay, for the right-handed player, I'm demonstrated by putting my racket down once again. As I go to pick it up, I bring my, rac my racket in my hand up to the camera with a western grip, as demonstrated here by the way my knuckle is almost running down the top of my racket handle. Then again, you also have the forehand grip and the backhand grip. Now, my forehand, like I said, I use a shake hands grip that, that uh, is the best one for me. Then again, I use a two-handed backhand so that I don't have to change hands. I don't have to change grips. I don't have to do anything. I just add the other hand and go ahead and swing. But for you, if you're using a, a one-handed backhand, this gets into a new category. You're going to have to maybe switch your grip a little bit so that you feel more comfortable hitting it on your backhand side and then switch it back to your forehand side. This is confusing. I gotta admit it, I, this is even confusing myself. Now if you get the full amount out of this, you're gonna be very good. But let me go through this again in, in ten, five easy steps. One, grab, a, grab the racket and hold on to the racket in a grip that is comfortable for you. Then you have to go out and find out if that grip is convenient for you in the way you're, you play in the style. Once you feel comfortable with your grip, then it works into a, a few other things. Your forehand grip to your backhand grip. You have to make sure on both sides you hold on to the racket firm. Do not let the racket wobble in your hand. You don't want to grab onto the racket and choke it. You want to just make sure that when you do grab onto the racket, it's, it's very firm. Your hand is very firm around the grip. Uh, you don't want to overemphasize the strength of the grip. You want to, to grab it and feel comfortable. Also, don't choke up on the racket handle. Make sure that you're in a comfortable position, but down so that you get the full amount of use out of the racket, which is to your advantage. But before all of this, make sure that when you do grab onto the racket, you find a grip, no matter what it is, and your, your pro or your friend or whoever can help you do this, make sure that you do find a grip that is comfortable for you and that you feel that you can use from the basics and the first you start on until you are the best. Well, the serve, number one, is, uh, is very important for, for a lot of reasons, but I think one reason is that uh, you have the balls in your own hand, so you're like the dealer. You, uh, you're starting off the point, you control the point. So getting the good basic foundation down and to where you feel comfortable is important. Okay, as you're preparing for the serve, I think the most important thing at the beginning is to step up and, and find a very relaxed, comfortable position. Some players choose to hold two balls in their hand. I, on the other hand, put one in my pocket so that I'm free to do what I need during the course of the point. Make sure that you're, you're sideways uh, to the point of, uh, of feeling good, 
and not too much facing, the, uh, facing forward to where you're going to be off balance once you do toss the ball. Uh, as I'm loose and relaxed, uh, my weight is on my front foot. I'm leaning a little bit forward with my racket out in front of my body. Uh, I'm holding onto the racket for balance so that when I go into uh, my swing where I bring the racket back, I feel I have more control over the racket. Now, as I'm leaning forward now preparing to serve, uh, my racket starts to go back and my arm starts to go up for the toss. And as I do that, my weight shifts back to the, my back foot so that as my racket is going up to meet the ball at the top or at its peak, I can push off on my back foot to get my maximum height and reach out of my body and my racket to make full contact and also move forward to go into the court. Now after all that, it should turn out to be something like this. The toss uh, once it leaves the hand, if you're left-handed for me, it goes to the, to the left side of my head so that when my racket is going back, it reaches up and strikes the ball at its peak. But the most important thing is, is you get the rhythm of the ball leaving your hand and the racket going back and eventually going above your head and striking the ball at its peak so that you can lean forward into the court and be on a forward kind of motion. Wow. When you toss the ball, some players have a high toss. For instance, like Lindell, who throws the ball extremely high. Another uh, form of the toss is one like either a McEnroe or a Roscoe Tanner had, who they throw the ball very low, but they also have a very quick backswing so that they catch the ball still at the, at the peak of the ball. Once you do toss the ball up, make sure that the, the ball is out in front of you so that, like I said just a minute ago, you do uh, want to lean into the ball and have a forward motion, uh, which is very important for me because I think tennis is a forward game. Well, bouncing the ball is, uh, some players do it, some players don't. Uh, when I first came on the scene, I bounced the ball in overabundance of times, and uh, I, I felt that that was good for me, that I was able to, to relax and to get my mind and my body straight to the point of uh, going in and being able to play the point. Uh, that's all over the years calmed down for me to the point where I step up and I bounce the ball four times now and, and go right into, uh, right into the action and get things started. Uh, I think bouncing the ball, uh, if you feel comfortable with it, if it's something that you like to do, and if you feel you can step up there and relax by doing that, then go ahead and do it. I don't think serve volley all the time uh, is on anybody's mind, really. I think it's just a matter of uh, making sure that when you toss the ball that you're thinking forward. Uh, it's just a matter of how forward you go. You can go into the court three or four feet, uh, or you can go all the way up and, uh, and, and make sure that you can volley the ball and catch the ball above the net and, and make it uh, that much better. Uh, I don't think serve volley all the time. I think getting my first serve in is important, uh, ending up inside the court so that I have the option of either going in all the way and taking the volley out of the air, or maybe even letting the ball bounce, hitting an approach shot, and moving forward from there. For me, the serve is the easiest one in the world to practice. Uh, just to, to go out by yourself with a bucket of balls and, and take 10 or 15 minutes and, and, uh, uh, in a very relaxed, easy atmosphere and just toss the ball up and, and make sure that you do it the same all the time. Uh, once you get the feel and once you've warmed up, then it's easier to go ahead and to, uh, to make targets, to, to put a can in each corner of a, of a service box and, and try to knock the cans over. But as far as the time goes, you've got the time, so you should do it right. Connor's grunt has become uh, uh, a little more noticeable now, I think, than, than a lot of people uh, have made a, a big deal about it. Uh, I've done that for as long as I can remember, and it's not... Uh, not by fault of anybody or myself. That's just the way that I breathe while I'm playing. And 
I, I inhale and I exhale as I'm striking the ball, which uh, makes you think as a, as a watcher, as a viewer, that I'm putting more into the shot than I, uh, than I actually am. Uh, which in a way that's good. Maybe you like that and, and you enjoy the sound or you don't enjoy it, and I'm, I'm sorry. But uh, it's something that really I've tried to change and I just can't change. It's, uh, it's the way that I've, uh, I've played. It's the, the way that it's my style of play. It's uh, the way that I breathe. It's the way that I strike the ball. So it, it's everything kind of built into one. And if I would change that, then that would be it. And hopefully you don't want that to be it yet. The ground strokes are, are, should be relatively easy, uh, if you remember just a, a number of points. One is to make sure you get your racket back so that when the ball is coming at you, you're in a nice easy motion to swing through and to make contact. Two is to catch the ball out in front of you. Uh, the, if you can catch the ball out in front of you, the further you catch the ball out in front of you, the better off you will be uh, as far as being able to make a solid contact, not catch the ball late, which you lose control in bringing your racket through and also to uh, keep your body to, uh, to one side, which means you turn your shoulder, which would move your right leg forward if you're left-handed, your left leg forward if you're right-handed, so that you're able to step into the ball uh, and get your whole body weight behind it. The best part of my game probably would be, uh, would be my ground strokes, and uh, the reason being would be that uh, I have a very solid, compact ground stroke that uh, is very, as far as I go, effortless and not overdone. Mm -hmm. uh, I take the racket straight back, which gives me time to, to see the ball coming and also be able to play the ball out in front of my body, which is very, very important. I have the minimum stroke only because I was taught by two women. Uh, my mother and my grandmother taught me that, so I, was, I would say that I have a, a woman's not, not a woman's game, but I have a, a, a woman's basic uh, stroke that, uh, that has worked for me. Now, I'm not saying that this is the best one. I'm not saying that, uh, that it's the one that you should be taught or the one that you like the most or you like somebody else's. That's fine. But I'm just saying that I get the maximum out of the, the minimum, the maximum effect out of the minimum stroke, and that's the way I like it. Okay, on the ground strokes, as we've said, take the racket straight back so that you have time that when the ball bounces, you're trying to bring your racket through and meet the ball in front of you and follow through to lift the ball over the net. Notice that every time I do make contact and I follow through, I'm getting back to the center of the court into a ready position so that I feel that I can take advantage of any situation that arises and I'm ready for it. But the most important thing is early preparation on my ground strokes. Rack it back so that I do have time to watch the ball, get down and lean into the ball to make good, solid contact in front of my body. Sometimes you have to improvise a little bit. Not every shot can be just perfect, just the way you want it. But the main thing is to have the basics down so that if you do improvise, that the basics can come through for you and help you get by with whatever is necessary. If you can do this, your ground stroke should improve and you will enjoy playing the game. Hitting the ball on the run uh, shouldn't be that much more difficult as, uh, as just a basic ground stroke except that you're hitting the ball on the move. So if you remember to get your racket back, and, and on the move with your shoulder turned and gliding into the ball and making sure you follow through once you make contact, this should work out for you. Uh, the problem is getting there in time and the kind of steps you take, uh, whether large or whether small, and, and that is really up to you. But making sure that once you get there with your racket back, you keep your eye on the ball and try to move in a forward motion uh, should work out and uh, shouldn't be that difficult. The best ground stroke players I've, uh, I've seen is, uh, I think number one has been Borg. Uh, he's been able to uh, hit his ground strokes, his forehand, whether standing still or on the run, uh, as well as anybody. 
Uh, he's had a different motion. He's played more with topspin, uh, where he drops his racket head and, and is able to come over the ball and, and hit the ball with speed uh, and also keep the ball uh, in with his dipping motion, which has made it difficult uh, for a lot of players. Uh, another uh, very, very powerful forehand in today's game is Yvonne Lindels. Uh, the way he hits the ball, the way he takes his racket back, the way he makes contact is uh, uh, he hits with a lot of power, a little bit flatter than Borg, which means it comes over at a lower trajectory where it has a little bit more speed and runs through the court a little bit faster. Hitting the backhand, either standing still or on the run, uh, is not that much more difficult, I don't think, than the forehand. The only problem is uh, you're reaching across your body to, uh, to hit the shot, which might be a little bit more difficult for some people. Uh, on the other hand, it should be more or less the same basic stroke, knowing that uh, you should get your racket back, uh, holding a firm grip, meet the ball out in front of you so that you get your body weight behind the ball, lean in and make good solid contact. As you know, uh, I hit a two-handed backhand, but for those of you out there who do hit a one-handed backhand, uh, for instance, the old-fashioned way, as I would call it, just joking, of course, uh, it, make sure that you do take your racket back and be prepared early. Now, you would probably switch to a backhand grip, which would take your index finger a little bit more to the top of the racket, to the top of the grip, so that your racket head would be a little bit flatter. So as you do take your racket back and your shoulder comes around, you have the option now of making sure when you do follow through that you can either follow through with top spin, which is coming down, dropping your racket head a little bit and making sure you follow through and coming over the ball, or from the same position, bring the racket through and catch the bottom of the ball, which would make it possible for you to slice the ball and keep the ball much lower. I started uh, using the double-handed backhand when, uh, when I first started, and that was because I was uh, a little bit small and I picked up a normal size racket. Uh, the racket was a little bit heavy, so I had to add my other hand to, number one, to be able to hold the racket, and two, to keep a little bit of control. Uh, as I got older, in a way, I tried to lose it. My, uh, my mother tried to take it away from me and, and see if I could go to a, a normal one-handed backhand. But I chose myself to stay with it and to, uh, to fight through it, whether right or whether wrong. Uh, now, as far as I go, I can't complain. It's been good for me. Uh, the results have been good, and I've enjoyed playing with it. Uh, on the other hand, there's some pros and cons that go along with the two-handed backhand. Uh, one good thing about it is that uh, because of the other hand, you add a little bit of extra power and extra strength hitting through the ball. Uh, two, I feel I have a little bit of uh, a little bit extra control where I can move the ball around and, and uh, keep the ball on my racket a little bit longer. Then on the other hand, uh, the cons are the points against is that I have to be just that much quicker. I, if I'm not uh, a step ahead or a half a step ahead, then I'm going to lose a little bit of reach in, in getting to the ball and and being able to control it to the point of which I feel I'm satisfied and, and I get the, the maximum out of the stroke that I want. Uh, I don't have to change grips in the middle of, uh, of a shot or middle of a point or whatever uh, to where I feel I'm going to confuse myself. On the other hand, uh, sometimes I'm playing shots uh, with this grip that uh, I don't really feel comfortable with either. So it's a, it's a matter of trying to, to find a balance that's uh, comfortable for me or for you if you use a two-handed backhand and being able to play accordingly. Uh, overall, I feel that uh, the two-handed backhand over the past uh, 15 or 20 years has made a huge jump uh, as far as uh, a lot of players, the young players, uh, taking advantage of it and, and enjoying playing with the two-handed backhand. But if you're not feeling good and playing up to your standard, then I suggest that uh, a one-handed backhand is for you. I don't think uh, really there's any two players who play exactly alike.
They have a number of choices. Some play with uh, top spin, some slice the ball, some hit the ball flat. Uh, those who hit with top spin, uh, I think a good example of that is Bjorn Borg, who uh, on both sides is forehand and backhand, would take his racket back and drop his racket head in the meantime so that when he made contact with the ball, he'd be brushing up from bottom to top so that the ball would leave his racket in a spinning matter to where it would hit the court and continue bouncing and continue on a high bounce. That is compared to a flat stroke, more or less, that, uh, that I use, where you take your racket straight back, and as you're meeting the ball, you come and hit the ball squarely off the racket. Uh, maybe at times a touch of topspin is, uh, is employed so that you make sure you lift the ball over the net and control it a little bit better. But I think all in all, you're meeting the ball with your racket head on so that you can get the maximum amount of speed. As compared to the slice, uh, when you take your racket back, you can take it back in a, in a straight back manner, but when you do meet the ball out in front of you, you're coming from high to low, so that you're brushing down on the ball from top to bottom, which, which keeps the, uh, the ball low, uh, not only traveling across the net, but also once it hits, the ball on the court will stay low and shoot through. That's how I hit a one-handed backhand. I use it really mostly when I'm out of position or I'm a little bit late and I have to get over there and slice the ball back just so I can get back into position. Then again, John McEnroe, the way he does it, he takes his racket back with his other hand, making sure that he's coming from top to bottom on the ball, leaning into the shot as he makes contact. This is good for him. He has full control of the racket. He controls the ball well, moves the ball around the court, and it works great for him. That's a difficult shot for me because it's just using one hand since I'm used to the two-handed backhand. But Yvonne Lindell, who I think has one of the best one-handed backhands in the game today, uh, moves back and is able to, with his strength, with the one-handed backhand, come through and power over the ball, hitting, with, hitting the ball with topspin, making sure it comes with pace and at the same time as it hits the ball, spins and bounces a little bit higher. Between McEnroe's slice and Lindell's uh, topspin backhand with one hand, I think they've got it covered. I, I realize that uh, I haven't 
named any women as far as uh, uh, great ground strokers. I should apologize for that, but uh, my game has been busy playing against a lot of the men. So, uh, but as it goes, I would say that uh, uh, some of the great women ground strokers are, are number one. Uh, Chrissy Everett has, has made her reputation on the way she's uh, played her ground strokes. Uh, she's been very consistent uh, with a very nice, easy, slow, uh, fluid stroke, which uh, made good solid contact in, in, uh, uh, in front of her body. Now, her ground strokes uh, and my ground strokes are, are a bit similar. I can't believe I passed this up and, uh, without a comparison here to the point of uh, being able to take the racket back uh, in a very compact motion uh, and getting the maximum out of the minimum, the maximum effect out of the minimum amount of effort. Uh, in comparison to her, Steffi Graf, who is uh, a relative newcomer on the scene now, uh, has come in with some very, very uh, powerful ground strokes, a very, very hard-hitting forehand uh, with a, a good, uh, compact slice backhand and also uh, the ability to hit an over uh, an overspin backhand. So the, the two contrasts there between Chrissy and Steffi uh, should make for uh, some very interesting matches between them and also uh, the way they play against the other players should be uh, some great tennis. The basics of the volley should be a bit easier for you. You're closer to the net, so you don't have to hit the ball at such a great distance to, to clear the net to get it over, so that you can continue to uh, play the ball or keep the ball in play. Uh, number one is to hold a good, firm, solid grip. Uh, your forehand grip or your backhand grip, whatever you feel comfortable with. Number two is to make sure that you uh, catch the ball out in front of you. Uh, as you do this, uh, I'm sure you want to turn your shoulder a little bit, if possible, uh, and, and get your body around as you do on your ground strokes so that you can, as you make contact and with that firm grip out in front of you, you don't lose control of the racket. Now, also remember that the down the top to bottom motion is important. This way you get a little underspin on the ball so that you don't lose control and let the ball go wild. <laughs> oh, wow. But sometimes you must improvise, like I just did, so that you don't get hurt. But most important, make sure you get your racket back early in a nice, easy, fluent motion. It's a not blocked, punched style of stroke. It's not a long backswing. It's a take the racket up so that when you catch the ball in front of you, you're moving forward and you can keep the ball under control. Also, sometimes you're going to have to hit the ball below the net. When you're below the net, you make sure you hold an even firmer grip so that as you're hitting up on the ball, you're not losing control. It's a very short, simple backswing and also very dangerous up here. Getting in position uh, for a volley is sometimes very difficult. Uh, you're closer to the net, the ball's coming at you a little bit faster, so sometimes it's reaction time and you do whatever it takes or whatever is necessary to, to play the ball. My footwork at the net is very similar to that of the baseline. I'm staying on the balls of my feet and picking my feet up and putting them down very solidly on the ground. The only difference that may arise is that my steps may be a little bit shorter do the fact that I'm in closer and don't have as much space to cover. For me, in, in the way I've played uh, throughout my time, I've always felt that uh, once I did come to the net that I would play the volley as, uh, as my final shot, as the, the point winner, so to speak. Uh, a lot of guys uh, that have played don't feel that way. They're able to, to get into the net and, and hit two or three or four volleys if necessary and, and and still come out of the, uh, the point feeling, that, uh, feeling confident. Uh, I've never felt that way. I've always felt that once I got to the net that I wanted to end the point, so I always felt more aggressive to the ball. I wanted to go up there and, and hurt the ball to the point of uh, not seeing it come back over the net. So I always put a little bit more pace on it, tried to uh, catch the ball a little bit further out in front of me at a higher point, uh, over the net so that when I did have a chance to really go for it that I was rewarded. Gay in the United States. Well, some of the best volleyers that, uh, that I've seen uh, 
number one, I think, should be, uh, should be John McEnroe. Uh, he's played uh, along with his serve, and uh, the way he volleys is, like I said before, has made him uh, one of the best that I've seen. Also, a lot of the Australians, uh, past and present, uh, made their reputation off their volleys because they were brought up on the grass, uh, which is a, a faster surface where you take most of the balls out of the air. Uh, it gave them an opportunity to, uh, to spend more time on their volley, to perfect their volley uh, a lot more. Uh, on the women's side, uh, I think there's uh, no one who volleys as well as uh, Martina Navratilova. She's, uh, uh, improved her ground strokes over the years, but I think her reputation and, and her feeling comfortable on a court would uh, surround herself around the net and uh, uh, her serve and volley activities. So uh, I would have to put her in there as uh, one of the top volleyers in the women's game. For the volley, you have to remember three things. One is get your racket up early so that you can make contact with the ball in a short punched motion. Two is come from top to bottom of the ball so that you do not lose control. And three, watching the ball early with a firm grip, you can catch the ball out in front of you and end it just like that. When you're in a position at the, at the net where your opponent must throw up a, a, a lob, uh, I think you're thinking mainly to uh, this is the shot that it's going to going to take for you to end the point, and uh, but you don't want to be overconfident or overreactive to uh, being able to play the overhead. You want to keep two things in mind. One, you want to be able to uh, make good solid contact and hit the ball firmly. That's very very important. Uh, so that if you do miscue a little bit, that you're still going to get uh, a little bit of power behind it to to hopefully get by and 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 win the point. Uh, two. Uh, is you want to make sure that uh, if you can, you're going to place the ball in, uh, in a position on the court where your opponent's not. I think that's the name of the game. The overhead's a very exciting shot. It's also an offensive shot, one that most players love to have the opportunity to hit. In a way, it's a bit like the serve. As you take your racket back, you get your racket back behind your head so that you have the opportunity to reach up and to catch the ball at its peak, getting the maximum amount of strength behind your shot. Uh, you also want to keep your head back and keep your eye very, very much glued to the ball so that you don't lose contact and you're able to follow through at the end. Let's try and see what happens. Sometimes your opponent throws up a very high lob. Maybe it's better to let the ball bounce at times to get a little better view of the ball. But remember to keep your head back, keep your eye glued to the ball because your opponent will get back into position a little bit quicker. It also gives yourself the opportunity to read the court a little bit to see where your opponent is. Let's give it a try. The windmill shot has been called a lot of things. Uh, one is my is a sky hook that uh, uh, that I enjoy playing a lot and, and uh, is a lot of fun for me. I think a lot of people that uh, are, are watching uh, the matches and watch the match that I'm playing uh, enjoy seeing that. Uh, they think it's uh, it's a lot harder than it is and. Uh, uh, sometimes it looks like I'm putting a lot more effort into the shot than I do, but uh, it's fun for me to play. It's uh, the shot that I like. I have confidence in that shot, so uh, uh, I recommend it for myself, and if you practice it, I might recommend it for you. I think any time you're, you're playing the game of tennis, so you, uh, 
you have two things in mind. One is you must watch the ball, and two is you have to keep a, uh, an instinct or, a, or an eye on where your opponent is at all times. Uh, the most important thing is to watch the ball. The more you play the game of tennis, the easier it is to, to have the instinct of where your opponent is or, or where, where he is not. Uh, keeping your eye on the ball and having a feel for your opponent is very important on all shots, not just the overhead or your ground strokes, but on all, all shots that uh, they're involved in the game. And the more you play, the easier it's going to be to, uh, to be able to feel the position of, uh, of your opponent and also get by with watching the ball. The lob is, uh, uh, is a shot that's very important uh, in the course of any match, uh, but then again there are two kinds of lobs. One is the, the defensive lob, uh, is uh, the shot that, that your opponent has you on the run, he's moving into the net, and you want to get over to a shot uh, and have the ability to throw the, the ball up very high uh, and try to keep your opponent off balance a little bit and back him up away from the net so that one has the time to get back in position. Uh, and hopefully stay in the point for a little while longer. Uh, two is the, uh, the offensive lob, uh, which is a shot that, that I like and enjoy using quite a bit, is, is where it's a, a normal stroke uh, as a ground stroke, and at the very last minute, you're going to just, uh, at the end of the shot, as you make contact with the ball, you're going to pull up a little bit and guide the ball uh, either down the line or across court over your opponent's head in an offensive motion so that you're taking the initiative trying to get to the net. Uh, it's a fun shot to practice and it's one that uh, would do you some good to learn. That's a defensive lob from my forehand side. I'm hitting the ball on the run and I'm very stretched out. So I must hold a good firm solid grip. It's also a little bit shorter stroke. I don't have time to take the racket all the way back. As I make contact, I make sure that I follow through, lifting the ball high in the air, giving myself a chance to get back to the middle of the court and get in position. My backhand defensive lob is a bit different. I'm hitting the ball on the run, so my racket's back early once again, but I'm also hitting the ball one-handed. I open my racket face a bit so that my racket angle gives me the chance to lift the ball high in the air, once again trying to get back in position to be prepared for the rest of the point. The topspin lob I just showed you was hit from behind the baseline and on the run. Uh, it's a shot used when your opponent is at the net uh, for you as the one hitting the lob to try to take a little bit of the initiative away, throw up a shot that is not as easy for your opponent to make contact with. Uh, the topspin lob is hit by dropping your racket head a little bit as you're moving towards the ball. As you make contact with the ball, you're coming up and over the, the ball itself to create topspin, which takes the ball higher above the net and also dropping the ball a little more rapidly at the end to try to keep the ball in the court. That's an offensive topspin lob. I'm moving in, I'm taking my racket back as I'm going to hit an approach shot. At the last minute, I drop my racket head a bit, come up and over the ball, lifting the ball over my opponent's head. It's a difficult shot. If you get it right, it'll work. That's my backhand offensive lob. I'm moving forward and I'm inside the court. I take my racket back very early and prepared as I'm going to hit a ground stroke, but at the last minute, I'm moving forward and I lift up casually on the ball with a little bit of topspin lifting it over my opponent's head into the open court.
Well, there's been some very good lobbers that I've seen along the way. Uh, one is Nastasi with uh, the feel that he had and, and the, uh, the strong hands and, and uh, the sh just the shot-making ability that, uh, that he was able to produce made him one of the finest lobbers I've seen. Uh, I think McEnroe uh, disguises his lob very well as far as uh, being able to hit it with top spin or underspin. He was able to disguise his shots uh, and his lobs enough to, uh, to keep a lot of uh, his opponents off guard also. I think one of the finest lobbers was Chrissy Everett. She, uh, I think she brought in the, the lob, the drop shot, and, and made it uh, a very, very well-known shot along the way for the women. And uh, since her time, since she began, a lot of the, uh, uh, the younger players that are coming along now have uh, developed a good lob and uh, are using it successfully. Well, the approach shot is something that I enjoy doing very much. I enjoy hitting the approach shot and, and having the ability to uh, work my way around the court to, uh, and work my opponent around the court to eventually get a, a ball that I feel comfortable with to where I can strike the ball firmly, be able to come into the net behind it, and eventually, hopefully, hit a winning volley. It's very important to, to remember two things uh, on the approach shot. One is to hold the racket firm again. You don't want to lose control of the racket because uh, you're hitting the ball, uh, hopefully, on the move. Uh, two, you want to, want to make sure that as you do make contact, you won't lose control of the ball at the same time as you follow through. So maybe a little bit of topspin uh, would bring the ball down and control it. If you're coming in and going to hit it with slice, make sure that you do hit the ball firm and keep moving forward as you do make contact. Preferably, you hit the approach shot off a short ball. Uh, uh, it's, that's really what you set the point up for, as you're moving around and, and hitting your ground strokes uh, and moving your opponent around, you're, you're waiting for a short ball to be able to attack. This is a, a, a very important part of the finish of the point, is to be able to hit the ball on the rise, on the move, uh, and make good solid contact so that you can take the offensive and get in there and, and, and make this uh, maybe not a winning shot, but one that uh, sets up the next shot so that you can continue on and win the point. My forehand approach shot can be played two ways, down the line or across court. But as I'm moving forward, my racket is back so that as I bring my racket through, I time the ball, moving my body forward so that I can put a little bit of topspin on the ball so that I clear the net and also bring the ball down, hopefully into the open court. My backhand approach shot is not much different. The difference is I play with two hands. I take my racket back early, prepare myself early, so that as I make contact with the ball, hopefully at the top of the bounce, my body is leaning forward and continuing to move so. The backhand approach shot can be played two ways, down the line or across court. It's your choice. Well, there are, there's two kind of approach shots. One is uh, the one that uh, you hit and you go directly to the net, and, and hopefully uh, you get the, the volley high enough to, to go for the winning shot. Uh, two, there's an approach shot uh, off a ground stroke to where you're, you're in the middle of a rally, you're playing your forehands and your backhands, and you feel that you've hit a, a ground stroke with enough pace, maybe uh, far enough away from your opponent to where he's going to be stretching to get to it. You sneak in to the net a little bit so that you can catch him off guard and catch the ball high above the net to go for the volley. Uh, I enjoy both. Uh, I do both in the course of my matches to the point of uh, uh, the element of surprise. And, and if it works out that uh, you can catch your opponent off guard once or twice, that's just another thought for him to contend with over the course of the match that may work in your favor. I would suggest that as you're practicing your approach shots, don't just let one uh, don't slide one by. Make sure that as you're practicing, you practice them all to the point of uh, perfecting the ones that you enjoy, the ones that uh, work best for you, but also having the opportunity to, to switch off and, and uh, work with another one once in a while. I think that's about how you do it. Go on, give it a try.